So let's get started. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us today on Skype a Scientist Live. Um, and thank you all, audience, for joining us today. So today, we're going to be talking all about genetics um, with a geneticist, Dr. Jeff. So um, could you introduce yourself, say who you are, what you do, and why you like it. And then for the rest of the session, we're going to be um, doing Q&A. If you need access to screen share, just let me know, and I'll make that happen. OK. Um, so what do I do, and what was, it? what was the second part? Just say who you are, what you do, why you like it, and then okay. from there, I'll moderate all of the Q&A, so you don't okay. need to worry about any of that. OK. So I am a population geneticist. I um, work at a biotech company as a bioinformatician, senior scientist, and I am also a podcaster. And so I have a podcast called In Those Genes, which In Those Genes, <laughs> which is a podcast that uses genetics to decode the lost histories and futures of African descendants. And I love what I do because I feel like it directly translates my work to the community, uh, to, to the community. And so I see it as like a tool for, you know, um, I call it like generational health, but like a tool to really just perpetuate um, all of the consciousness that I have to future generations. Awesome. So is the work that you do at the biotech company um, as a population geneticist slash bioinformatician, um, is that related to the work that you do uh, at the podcast or are these kind of two uh, slightly overlapping but not the same kind of things? Yeah, these are completely different things. Um, you know, everything that I do with the podcast is completely personal, separate from my nine to five job. Um, in fact, a lot of my coworkers didn't even know I had a podcast <laughs> probably until uh, quite recently, but everything I do is completely separate. So the only thing I would say that's connected is that my training um, as a scientist really has, you know, really has been kind of like the the reason why I've developed the podcast because I see everything that I know as being completely beneficial to have like this skill set and then to be able to use this skill set and this expertise in a way to benefit the community. Um, but they are completely separate. <laughs> Awesome. So um, I know what bioinformatics is because my best friend is a bioinformatician, and so I have a, a vague sense of what that is. But could you tell the audience like what exactly a bioinformatician is and how computers and science or biology rather come together? Yes. Yeah, so a bioinformatician is a science is a scientist that uses computer science to understand insights about biology, and so. Uh, human geneticists use computer science to decode the genome, if you will, and to connect uh, the genome with diseases and traits. Cool. Um, so we've got our first question coming in from Alexis. Uh, who is your favorite rapper? Asks Alexis. Ooh. I, okay. So like when we talk about hip hop, I feel like I always talk about the top five. So you guys might remember this really horrible horrible, horrible film by Chris Rock. <laughs> it was not good. But it wasn't horrible. It wasn't like soul plane bad, but it wasn't like great. It was mediocre. But anyway, it's called Top 5. And typically in hip hop, we like list our top five dead or alive, right? So I'll do my top five. Um, so, and I'm willing to debate people who, if you're like really into hip hop, we can fight over it. It's fine. Um, <laughs> and also, fun fact, um, I have during quarantine, I have been um, hoarding plants. So I've been buying a lot of plants. I have about 14 and they're all named after rappers. So all five of these are named after rappers. Um, I'll tell you the plants too. So number one is Jay Electronica. He's from New Orleans. Uh, he has historically been known for being a, a feature artist and never like really having an album, like a mixtape kind of guy. And I named my elephant ear plant after him. Um, <laughs> another one is Black Thought. Black Thought is the lead rapper from The Roots. Um, I think he's extremely underrated, um, but is super, 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 super dope. And my third, well, these are not in order. So, um, another favorite of mine is Andre 3000 from Outkast. And my banana, I mean, I'm a banana, my Birds of Paradise plant is named after him. <laughs> 
Um, a fourth is more of a newer artist, and that's Kendrick Lamar. I really like Kendrick Lamar. I see him as someone who kind of like, you know, developed his own consciousness and plays this fine line of like, you know, how do I take what I know and apply it to like how I was raised? And my snake plant is named after him. <laughs> and my number five, who's my number five? I'm forgetting someone. It'll vary, so I'm just gonna go with what's on the top of my head, and that's a tribe called Quest. That is a group of three people, and actually I have three succulents in my bedroom, and I call them a tribe called Quest, named after the three uh, <laughs> the three members of that group. So that's awesome. More than one. I think Kendrick Lamar is wonderful for the for my sake of writing science trivia <laughs> because he wrote a song about DNA, so it all <laughs> comes together. It's perfect. How could I not like him after that? I know, right? <laughs> um, all right, so the next question is from Sasha and Roman. Um, they want to know, are you studying the genes of uh, enslaved, the descendants of enslaved people? So um, studying is an is a interesting word because I work in industry now. So I don't have a formalized research program. Um, I'm still very connected to academia. So I don't actually have like a research program. But to answer your question indirectly, yes, because with the podcast, everything is centered of African descendants, and majority of the African descendants that we discuss on the show are um, African descendants of slaves. And so that are these are African descendants who live in the Americas. Um, a lot of times we talk about that context, but we really are broad in terms of including African descendants of the diaspora. And when we say slave descendants, it's also a really interesting thing that people mention that because I think a lot of people, white people in America included, may not realize that they are descendants of slaves as well, you know? Um, and so I always, like, when people say that, I always wonder what they mean. Because if you live in America, it is likely that you probably have some African ancestry, and it's more than likely that that African ancestry is descended from a former slave. But that's just my two cents. <laughs> awesome. Um, so are you familiar with this group at um, Howard University that has a whole center for studying? Um, I'm not super sure on the specifics. I went to a talk on this like three years ago, but it's all about studying the genetics of uh, the diaspora. Yeah, I think that is Fatima's group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I met her last year actually at another conference but I knew no I, I met her several years ago but like I think if she saw me again she would know who I am kind of thing right. you know like all the scientists in here you know you meet someone in grad school and they're like oh okay you're like super excited you're like oh you're the first author of this paper that I love and you they don't know who you are but then totally. later on, yeah. they're like oh you're Janina I remember you from 10 years ago <laughs> but yeah I am familiar with that group cool yeah they seem to be doing really cool stuff um, okay, so the next question from Caitlin um, is, what's your favorite thing about being a geneticist? Um, who? My favorite thing about being a geneticist is kind of like what I was saying earlier, this concept of, so you might hear physicians say, uh, or other scientists say, bench to bedside. And that's like this common phrase that like what I'm doing on the bench you know, in the lab directly translate to the hospital bed, right? And that there's a clear clinical, you know, correlation. But as a geneticist, we like to say base pair to bedside. So base pair is talking about like, you know, the DNA helix, A, T, C, and G. And we are connecting what we learn about the genome directly to the bedside. So kind of like that concept. What I love the most about it though, is that I'm able to talk about my work in a way that the community can understand. And also the work that I'm doing is directly being, you know, translated to the community. And I absolutely love that. Like, I think it's so translational. And another thing I love is that I think human genetics in particular is a very collaborative field. So like, I'm a community, I'm a really big community person. And so I like community, I thrive in community. So I like how much in our, in our field we work together. We have to, because we need like these large sample sizes. For sure. So um, at your job, are you, like when you talk about base pair to bedside, are you taking the samples from individuals that are currently sick or looking for um, kind of answers for how to get better? Or are you looking at like, 
huge population sizes to identify, for example, I don't know, a gene that is like, or a, a variant of a gene that is associated with disease. So in my previous life, um, in my previous life as a scientist in academia, I was doing that. In my current life in biotech, what I'm actually doing is creating the technology that enables that. And so in genetics, we have two type of technologies, um, major technologies, there's plenty, but major technologies that my company focuses on. One of them is sequencing and the other one is genotyping. And just in short, um, if you think about your genome as a book, sequencing would be having every single letter in that book. Uh, genotyping, on the other hand, is having certain paragraphs here and there, but enough paragraphs that you understand the whole story. Um, what I do is I select the paragraphs in the book. So those paragraphs might look different from a person of African descent versus a person of European descent or East Asian descent. And so I am creating and selecting these different paragraphs for different populations. And so by doing that, this technology is way cheaper. So if I only need the paragraphs, then maybe my book only costs $20. If I need every single letter, that book might be $2,000. And so creating, like figuring out what paragraphs I need is extremely important in enabling genetic technology for the world. And I'm talking about areas where in scientists who can't afford a $2,000 book, they can only afford a $20 book. But we gotta make sure the $20 book that we sell them is great, informative and that they can use it to do exactly what you talked about which is making connections with the genome with diseases and so that's what i do uh <laughs> in biotech awesome that sounds super cool um let's see so the next question is from caitlin if you did not become a geneticist what do you think your second choice career would have been you know that has really changed over time um now, I would say my second career would definitely be, and kind of already is, a, a journalist. Like, I started a podcast two years ago, didn't know anything about podcasting, and now I have just become obsessed with journalism. And especially in an era of today where we have so much that you know, trying to be like journalistically sound and accurate, particularly in science, particularly in underserved communities is so important. And so right now I would say I would be a journalist and kind of am. <laughs> yeah, as a podcaster, you're totally in that realm. That <laughs> totally makes sense. Awesome. Um, all right, the next question is from Markia. When did you fall in love with science? Um, as a young child. So when I was little, I wanted to be a mathematician. And that's because like I knew math really well. In fact, like my dad, we would play games when we were driving in the car. And if we came to a stop sign, my brother and I had to look at the license plate ahead of us and like add, multiply, divide, subtract the, the numbers. And so I was like, I'm so good at this. I'm gonna be a mathematician. It's the only thing that I'm good at. And then I started doing science fairs and I liked the creative process of developing experiments and thinking about things in a new way. And once I realized that, I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't stop doing this. Um, and, and that's when I fell in love with science. So I must have been like seven, eight years old. That's awesome. I, I think that you make a really good point. Like I think a lot of times, at least when I was a kid, I thought of like artists as being creative and scientists as being analytical. But being a scientist is super creative. You need to be super creative to do science effectively. Um, so that's always a good thing to mention. Uh, yes. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, awesome. So the next question is from Catherine. Um, okay. Can you talk about immunoprivilege and the different ways that it manifests? And maybe tell us what immunoprivilege even is? Because I yeah. Don't well, good thing is, is that I know, <laughs> and I only knew, <laughs> and, and it's really interesting because had you asked me that question this time last year, I would not know. Um, I would have been, you know, I would have just said I didn't know, but I recently learned about immunoprivilege in my podcast. We were developing, um, when coronavirus happened, we uh, did a coronavirus episode. I suggest you all go listen to it. It's called that Rona. And then ever since then, we do a 10 to 15 minute clip at the top of the rest of the season. And we've been doing a little updates here and there. And through like researching through that process, I learned about this idea of immunoprivilege, which means that people who have immunity to a particular virus have privilege over those who don't. 
And the reason why it's incredibly important right now, or at least what I learned was that it kind of developed with yellow fever and well, the IV or the term um, was kind of first coined then. And it was this idea that like, particularly in talking about how it manifests, it really manifests in many different ways. But let's talk about it in a context where we don't have a vaccine. In a context where we don't have a vaccine, people who've already come in contact with the virus develop immunity, or I'm saying immunity in quotations because we don't know what that means if we don't have a vaccine. Right. And so um, back then with yellow fever, there were lots of stories, particularly stories of people who were domestic workers or people who were essential workers is the new catchphrase, right? Essential workers. And essential workers were trying to get this quote unquote immunoprivilege. And the reason why they were trying to get it is because if they had immunity, they were then, you know, had access to go work. And that would be to work in people's homes. That would be to work, you know, at rest, whatever, whatever type of essential work that is. You needed to have immunity in order to do it. And I could see that manifesting with COVID-19, um, where, you know, people who are going to be able to, you know, move freely, and it hasn't happened yet. It looks like we're trending more towards herd immunity, if you ask me, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but this idea that, um, it can it really manifests in communities who are at a disadvantage. We are seeking immunoprivilege so that we can go out and do things that we need to to for our for our lives. And so that's one way that it manifests that's extremely sad to me because what can happen and what did happen with yellow fever is that a lot of especially the um, especially African Americans at that time, where all of our jobs at that time were pretty much quote unquote essential workers. So having uh, immunity to something like yellow fever was extremely important. And so what people were doing were trying to get sick, trying to get sick so that they could get the immunity. But it's extremely, extremely, extremely dangerous, right? Because right. everyone doesn't survive. And that is a scary part about this quote unquote immunoprivilege. I hope that doesn't happen with COVID-19. Um, but, you know, if we don't, put into practice things to prevent that. And that really just needs health equity, which we know is a huge problem now. Always has been a problem, but new to, to some people. Um, if, we don't, if we don't actually take the time to do that, we're gonna be faced with the same thing. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for uh, sharing that with us. The next question um, is from Rob. Uh, this is a good question. What are some misconceptions about human genetics that you encounter the most or personally bother you the most? Oh, okay. So what is like a huge pet peeve of mine? And that's when the lay community says, um, oh, I don't have that gene. Or, oh, I have that gene. And it's just like, yeah. okay, so let's, 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 let's dissect what this really means, right? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, when they're saying that, what they're really trying to say is that they don't have a variant for a gene. So, you know, we all have the same 25,000 or so, a little bit less than 25,000 genes as humans, right? We're 99% the same. Um, and so what we're really talking about is variations within that gene. So if we go back to our book analogy and we think about a paragraph being a gene, well, we might be missing like uh, the letter A, like a book, you know, in that paragraph. Right. Or instead of the letter A, someone has, you know, a, a T in there, you know, like one little letter in a paragraph is really what we're talking about that are the differences. So when people say, I don't have that gene, I'm like, oh my God, you do. You don't have the variant in that gene perhaps. But yeah, I don't like it when people say that. <laughs> it's that a huge misconception. Um, another one um, would be kind of around ancestry. So, you know, we live in a world we created this thing called race, right? We created this concept called race. And what's really interesting is that this concept called race has been considered kind of like uh, this like qualitative thing, not qualitative, um, yeah, qualitative thing. Yeah, I think I said that right. Yeah, we kind of categorize it where it's like black, white, Asian, whatever. Uh, but essentially, it's not that, right? Essentially, genetic ancestry is a continuum. And you're not just Nigerian or, you know, German 
right. because of the way human populations and because of the way that we have made it over time. And also like even more recently, we've become more transient as humans. I mean, hello, look at COVID-19. This would never have happened a hundred years ago if right. we weren't such a transient population. But because of that, and because of the history of humans moving about and traveling across the world, we are more than just, you know, and also human identified country definition, right? We are really kind of like this continuum of genetic ancestry that tells a beautiful story about our ancestors all across the world. And so I hate when people like, you know, I'm just this, like, <laughs> because we're subscribing to like this social concept of race, which is not real. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, um, so I read, uh, which you may have also read this book called Superior, uh, Superior. And so in that book, they really hammer home repeatedly, like, we have more in common than what makes us different. Like there's no set of genes that's like African, uh, East Asian. Like it's, we're all more the same than we are different. We're just human. Yeah. That's really, exactly. that's a super common misconception. Um, all right. So Zarin wants to know, since genetics is such a collaborative field, um, I'm, uh, let's see. Okay, so have you worked with genetic counselors? And um, is there any like crosstalk between what you do and genetic counseling? So it's so funny that, um, that's a great question. When I was getting my PhD at Vanderbilt, we had to do a clinical rotation, which is very strange. Like most PhDs don't do clinical rotations, but our, our advisors were just so amazing. They were like, you should do a clinical rotation. That was my first time ever working with a genetic counselor. And basically, we shadowed a genetic counselor. I was shadowing a genetic counselor in a cardiovascular clinic because my PhD was focused on cardiovascular disease. And she, I would watch her explain genetics to families who had, you know, a, a child with a rare cardiovascular um, disease and likely had a rare cardiovascular variant. And that was my first time ever working with a genetic counselor. And sadly, it was my last time kind of working with a genetic counselor. Um, I have, so I have met genetic counselors more recently. In fact, shout out to all the genetic counselors because they really have elevated my podcast and I could not be so like, so grateful. And so I have become extremely connected to genetic counselors and that entire field. And I was completely missing from it being, you know, on the science side of things. I'm so grateful to be included on it now. And that's how I've been working with genetic counselors more recently. We had one on our episode with 23andMe, um, Altavise Ewing. She is a PhD uh, human geneticist. <laughs> we can talk about that too, human geneticist. Um, and she at the time was working at 23andMe. And so she's a genetic counselor and she and I now are good friends. And um, so, that's the, been the extent in which I work with genetic counselors. But what I do on the podcast is exactly what genetic counselors do. And so I like have a deep admiration for genetic counselors. Love, love, love them. <laughs> Super cool. And we're also going to be talking with um, a genetic counselor tomorrow. Uh, so at 5.30 p.m., uh, same, same place right here. You can go to skypeascientist.com and get that link. So that'll be a thing we're doing tomorrow. Um, so here's a fun question from Alexis. Who are some of your scientific heroes? Ooh. Oh, so, oh, let me see if I can. I'm going to change my, I'm going to change my screen real quick because I have one in my, in my room. Maybe you can see. Um, all right. I'm going to tilt my screen up a little bit. That big picture right there. She's a big one. Um, that's Henrietta Lacks. And she is like my scientific heroine like I she, Shiro Shiro not heroine Shiro, Shiro but yeah she's a hero too I mean so this artist he did a series um where he took eight black women and he turned them into superheroes and hers is the incredible Hulk and you can't see this but there's all of this writing around her that talk about her scientific accomplishments uh, unbeknownst to her if you're familiar with her story and so she is my scientific hero. We would not even know about the human genome if we didn't have access to HeLa cells, Henrietta Lacks uh, cells. We would not know that we had, you know, 23 pairs of chromosomes if it wasn't for Henrietta Lacks. So she's deeply connected to genetics. We wouldn't have an HPV vaccine if it wasn't for Henrietta Lacks. And so she is my absolute genetic hero. I absolutely love her. 
Um, and then I guess like some genetic or, or some scientific heroes who are still living that I want to give, give them their flowers. Um, one of them is my PhD advisor, Dr. Dana Crawford. Um, she literally is the reason that I am here to talk about this today and has taught me so much professionally and personally. Um, she's definitely been an advocate for me during my PhD and long after. And I would just say there's just a group of women scientists who were at Vanderbilt who really helped, you know, cultivate me. And, and they were my village, my Vanderbilt village, I like to call them, um, as well as some scientists that I work with in my undergraduate, uh, my undergraduate, my undergraduate experience. And one of those is Dr. Kimberly Jackson. And so she was who I worked with when I was at Spelman. Um, and all of, I would say, the budding geneticists, so I see Jaslyn in here, <laughs> I see Deanna in here. Um, so some of them who are, who are on the call today, like the, um, the next generation, uh, Trinell is in here, the next generation of geneticists, these are black women geneticists who are working to advocate for the same things that I advocate for and love. Um, they are definitely my heroes as well. Super cool. Um, Jaslyn, actually speaking of her, would like to know, uh, what do you do to celebrate and acknowledge your accomplishments? For example, that 2020 ASHG Advocacy Award. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a good question. I'm probably not that great at it. So I'll say this. I don't think that like I, I do like one big thing, but I do, uh, I do, do, I do, do things daily. I do a lot of like, and probably need to cut back a little bit on like <laughs> self time. So my company is based in San Diego. I typically start work later in the afternoon. So maybe like 11, 12 o'clock is when I really start work. But I'm up at like 6.37 and all the time before then is my time. And so I do different things in the morning and I also, I've always worked from home. So this is my office slash guest room, as you can see. And I always work from home. So I kind of used to this whole like build your own schedule thing. And mornings are extremely important to me. So I celebrate myself every morning. You know, I do work, I work out, I do a meditation. And sometimes I'll like do something extra. I didn't necessarily, I don't think I did anything extra. I probably bought some more plants. That's probably what I did. I probably bought some more plants, but that morning time is kind of like my gift to myself every day, just being grateful. That's beautiful. Don't say that you should do less of that. We <laughs> all need to get on your level and do more of that instead you know, of just like, sometimes so I get carried away and don't start working until two, and I'm like, ooh, this is, hmm. this is, this is a little late. <laughs> During a pandemic, in my opinion, doing, like, just getting out of bed and doing work at all is an accomplishment. Because uh, I know some of my friends, like some of my most high functioning friends, most like productive workhouse friends are just like, I took a five hour nap in the middle of the day today. I can't do anything. So we're all just doing our best out here. Um, <laughs> cool. So Sasha and Roman would like to know, do you have a, a, a partner that you work with in your job? Like a science, like a, like a life lab partner? A life at my job. Not at my job, no. But I have work wives, if that's the question. <laughs> I have work wives, that's great. I have work wives and we've always had long distance relationships. Um, <laughs> so one of them I met in my postdoc, um, her name is Jessica Cook Bailey. She also has an amazing lab over at Case Western. She was doing her postdoc at Vanderbilt um, while I was like leaving Vanderbilt and we overlapped for six months and been, have, have been inseparable in our long distance work-wife relationship. Um, and then another is Dr. Shira Blazer. She's at NYU. She also is the expert that we had on the Dat Rona episode. And she and I have been friends for like the past two years. We're completely obsessed with each other and we Marco Polo science nerdy things all day. She is a rheumatologist, so she is teaching me all the immunology and things that I need to learn. And she's also a budding geneticist, and I teach her all the genetics things. And so we just nerd out literally daily. <laughs> but she's a somewhat long distance work wife. She's at NYU. Having, having work buddies is so important. I'm, yeah, I'm working alone right now and just text my uh, grad school roommate 
constantly um, <laughs> to stay, stay sane. Um, so when did you realize that you wanted to go specifically into genetics? Like what was it about genetics that appealed to you? That's so funny. Um, and it's not a very well thought out thing. My uh, genetics thing kind of started at Spelman. So I did my undergraduate at Spelman, which is a small liberal arts college, a historically black college uh, for women. And I was a biology major who also had a very big social life-ish, a social life for a biology major. Of my friends, I had the least, <laughs> I did not, I was the not social one, but for other biology majors, I was. I had too much fun. As a result, I didn't get a lot of great grades. And in fact, the only A that I got was in genetics. And I was like, man, like this just seems, it just comes natural to me. I also uh, worked as a research assistant um, as an undergraduate. And so I worked in a, what we call a damp lab, you know, so bioinformaticians typically work in dry labs, which are completely computational. At the time, I w it was my first introduction to something that was somewhat computational. And I worked in a bovine genetics lab. And so that kind of started it too. And then when I got to Vanderbilt, I wanted to be in a lab that did not require me to be at a bench. <laughs> and so I joined the human genetics department and became completely computational. Sweet. Um, Rob would like to know, in addition to your own podcast, which you should remind us a couple times of the name of, so we all remember. In that Those Genes. In Those Genes. Great. So in addition to In Those Genes, can you suggest any books, documentaries, et cetera, that can help folks, especially younger folks, interested in learning about human genetics? Ooh, that's a good question. So like, I haven't read like many genetics books. Um, people have told me, oh, oh, okay. People have told me about some, I guess it depends on what type of reading are we talking about. Um, so, hmm, I'm thinking about Dorothy Roberts' book, and that one is not, I don't believe it's about genetics. I haven't read it yet. Um, it's more so about inequity in medicine. And then there is, uh, Carl, uh, Zimmer, Carl Zimmer. Yeah has a book, um, I think it's called, uh, something about my are, mother's laugh. What'd you say? Something about my mother's laugh. My, my, yeah, my mother's genome or something like, I actually have it in here somewhere and I'm trying to see if I, I haven't read it yet. It's a very lengthy book. She <laughs> has a um, mother's laugh. Maybe. Yeah, is that what it's called? She has her mother's laugh, the powers, perversions, and potential of heredity. He may have done more than one on genetics. That's just one that I know came out like in the last year-ish. Yeah, she has her mother's laugh. That's the one that that's that's the one that I'm referring to. Um, so Carl Zimmer. Oh, he also has a really great piece called Biology of the Genomes, which is fun. Uh, a lot of us liked it because it was kind of like it kind of has like a Game of Thrones inspired theme. Um, oh, a good movie that I watched very early on, Gattaca. Oh yeah, <laughs> you gotta watch Gattaca. Uh, was it just books in, in uh, any like anything that would be educational works? Okay, um, so podcasts definitely in those genes, podcasts, um, other like science podcasts that I like but are not really focused on genetics, um, is Science Versus, and they actually did a whole season called Gametes, um, which kind of focuses on like the science of sex and gender, um, and I think that's really cool. And um, hopefully, hopefully in the next year or two years, and I've never said this publicly, um, I will have a book too. <laughs> Yay. So yes, I, I, um, <laughs> I am in the process of doing that, but very early, early, early stages. So look out for that. Awesome. Um, my buddy Jenkins, the bioinformatician, also recommends the gene, um, but it might be tough for younger kids. It's like, it's one of those tome length books. Um, but The Gene is uh, a book, a, like a popular science book that uh, comes recommended. Um, speaking of Game of Thrones, who is oh, oh, before you say, before, uh, before you oh, go, okay, on, uh, two other books that are not like specifically talking about genetics, but I think have like a genetic spin to it that are really good. One of them is called The Warmth of Other Suns. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Okay. It's about the great migration. I find it very interesting. I mean, if you are a geneticist reading the book, you will make it your own genetic interpretation. Right. Um, and then the other one is homegoing. So home, these are both like, these are um, both 
um, nonfiction, uh, not nonfiction, fiction. Okay. And um, they are, I think they're fiction at least, they, uh, the homegoing is about a story of, of generations. So both of them are stories about generations. And I think I would say that that's genetic, but you're not going to learn any like new genetic concepts from it, like you will from my book. But anyway. <laughs> cool. Um, Alexis wants to know, uh, who's your favorite Game of Thrones character and why is it Miss Andi? Um, dang, I'm blanking on the name. Okay, so, um, I used to like Daenerys. Um, I used to like her. <laughs> I used to like her. But I think if I look at the whole series as a whole, and why am I blanking on her name? Um, the youngest, the youngest sister. Arya? Arya. Arya, I would say it's like my consistent favorite. Like Daenerys was like, uh, I was actually her for home, uh, for Halloween once. Really? Like, she was like all over, pl all over the place, but yeah, area is like. Nice. I think Tormund's my favorite. Oh. I like a lot. He's a, he's a piece of work. Um, okay. So the next question is what motivated you uh, to start your In Those Jeans podcast? And what advice would you give to people who want to start their own similar educational or outreach media? Okay. Um, so In Those Jeans was kind of started because of a Spotify competition. So in 2018, Spotify put out a competition um, that went crazy on Black Twitter and all kind of like Black social media. And they were saying um, it was for women of color in podcasting. And they put out an ad and basically you just pitched it. And you, you just wrote out an application to pitch your own podcast. A friend of mine told me about it. And he was like, you should do one. And I was like, what am I going to do a podcast about? And he was like, because I was already at the time like doing a lot of public speaking yeah. around like career development and genetics and whatever. And he was like, it could be about genetics. And I was just like, whatever. And my best things come to me and also the worst things at night when I'm sleeping. Yeah. So I went to bed that night. I woke up the next day and I was like, in those jeans. Like I already knew the name of the podcast. And I was like, oh, I could do this. And I went to go see when the application was due. It was due that day. And that evening, I put aside two hours, three, three hours, I don't know, wrote the application, which when I read it now, it's like, ugh. but um, 18,000 people applied and I was selected out of, I was selected to the top 10 and then I won. Oh, um, oh congratulations. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So I didn't know anything about podcasting. The motivation really came from this competition. And right. after winning the competition, which was a grant for $10,000 to make my pilot episode, I have not looked back. I tell people, if you are interested in doing this, um, one thing that I would say is kind of really start to get good with communication. And I mean like soft skills, like really soft communication and trying to think about and try to make yourself familiar with things that are relatable. So people don't realize this, but pop culture is a huge part of this. Um, and a lot of scientists are like, Ugh, pop culture, like, no, like I'm a scientist. I'm supposed to not care about pop culture and only care about nerd things. But if you, if your goal, what is your end goal? If your goal is to connect with the community, pop culture is extremely relevant. And so we actually have someone who works um, on our staff who is connected to pop culture. And he has a pop culture YouTube show that is about like real housewives of whatever. I don't even watch any of that stuff, but he is so connected that he helps us connect these science concepts to pop culture trends so that we're relatable. Because the thing is, is about finding an entry point to the audience that you want to connect with. And that entry point will come natural to you if you are a part of that community and using that as kind of like the vessel to deliver your message. That's awesome advice. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So one last question before we do our like wrap up questions, which take, which take a couple minutes. Um, okay. uh, someone asked, I'm in love with Henrietta Lex. Who is the artist of the portrait behind you? His name is Bart. Uh, hold on. I'm going to find it. It's okay. It'll take your time. His name is Bart, but I don't know. Oh, that Bart Cooper. Bart Cooper. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. So before we wrap up, um, is there anything that you would like to plug? Anything that you uh, want to get out there? In your jeans, of course. I'm not sure. Uh, Alexa, stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we have time, I would like to, I, I would love to play a clip of the podcast if there's, Do it. Yeah, if we there's time. time for it. Um, and what else did you ask me? Is there anything that I would like is to plug? Is there anything plug? you want to plug? Um, 
So I would, I would like to plug our second season. We are in the process of funding. So I am not a podcaster. I have to hire a producer to edit and I also have a music producer because our podcast is super hip hop focused. We actually create, originally create everything you hear in our show. And we have a lot of music, at least three to four songs an episode. And that costs money. Um, and right now I'm just, you know, eating ramen noodles and burning away my own money. Uh, but now I've run out of that and now I have to do funding. And so we are in the process of raising funding. Right now we only have a third of the second season funded. And so that means we only have funding to produce three to five episodes right now. And we typically like we produce 12. And so we really, 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 really need help with securing funding. Um, and so anyone who wants to donate, you can give a one-time donation through our PayPal, um, which you can find on our website in those jeans. You could also um, become a patron, which means that you would give donation, you would give a donation to us once a month. Um, and all we ask is a minimum of $2 donations a month. And collectively, that helps pay off some of our bills. And then um, I'm trying to find a, um, I, I'm trying to, so also I, I'll just say our second season um, is tentatively titled Pseudo Jeans. And the whole purpose of the second season will focus on dispelling long holding myths about the inherit about inheritance and beliefs so one of them is that black don't crack that you know having african um having african ancestry kind of like slows aging um and so we're going to be diving into topics like that and really trying to understand is this truly genetic or not so anyone who wants to be motivated about what season two is going to be that's it so if you're interested in that other things we'll talk about is kind of like this idea of slavery and trauma and is trauma inherited. So we're going to be playing around with what really is genetic or not. Um, so if anyone is interested, please, 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 please donate. Okay. So I'm going to be playing a clip of the podcast. Uh, the, the, the clip that I'm playing is uh, when we did a... Um, when we did a rap battle. And the reason why I'm playing this clip is because it was recently, this episode was recently recognized by IndieWire as one of the best episodes of 2020, which is a huge accomplishment for us because we are a little independent podcast with no money. <laughs> so whenever we get, uh, when we get recognized, it really does help, you know, fuel the energy and excitement around the show. Awesome. I just subscribed on my podcast app. Yes. And if everyone is here, another big favor you can do for us is if ever, if another big thing you can do for us is if you are on Apple Podcasts, if you go in and you rate us, please write a comment. Um, let us know how you feel about the show. These things really help add value when we're pitching to networks and asking for money. Um, so what I'm going to play right now is a clip from episode three. Um, it does have some language in it. Is that okay? Uh, ooh, well, you know, we warned them. So, so go for it. Okay. We said that there was going to be language. So if anybody wants to leave right now, you may. That'll be, yes. we're good. Okay. Um, well, I have a couple of clips. I can play a different clip, actually. Okay. Um, I'll play, I'll play the Henrietta Lacks clip for those okay, of you that's who great. are not who are not familiar with Henrietta Lacks. If you are interested, episode three, the clip that I was gonna play was a rap battle. And in the clip that I was gonna play, we use a hip hop song to teach people how to understand uh, genetic ancestry. But I'm gonna play the Henrietta Lacks clip instead. Thanks. <laughs> Can you hear? It was 1951 in Baltimore, Maryland. A young woman, Henrietta, was experiencing severe vaginal bleeding. Trusting the only facility at that time that treated poor African Americans, she went to John Hopkins Hospital, desperate to stop bleeding. In addition to providing care for Mrs. Lax, the physician noticed something about her cells. They didn't die. Instead of getting her consent to study the cause of her immortal cells, he decided to steal them without her consent. The only credit he gave her was naming the cells an abbreviated version of her name, Hela Cells. 
To date, this is the most common human cell line that exists in the research labs. Her cells are in part responsible for the eradication of polio, creating HPV vaccines, sequencing the human genome, and understanding diseases like cancer, HIV, and so much more. Mrs. Lax died at 31, and it isn't until recently that the story on the misuse of her data has come to light. And while her family has been compensated with some money, Mrs. Lax didn't have the option or privilege to consent to the use of her data, but we do. We have the privilege to consent. Many of us have the privilege to read and the privilege to research and use powerful tools like the internet to understand these T's and C's. And many of us have the ability to help out those in our community who can read and research. We've experienced a long history of having things done to us without our say. And while institutional BS still inflicts oppression on us day in and day out, I want us to at least be able to arm ourselves with the tools to become authors of our own stories. Don't let companies do things with your genome without your true consent. Read them T's and C's, fam. That was great. Um, I, I, I had no idea Henrietta Lacks was 31. That's, I thought she was like in her 50s. That's so young. So young. That's awful. Okay. Well, that was um, that was really great. I'm I was just writing a tweet to share about your podcast because I hope I hope you get a big spike in subscribers after this. Um, Thank you so much. Cool. Okay. So uh, two questions that we ask everybody um, as we wrap up. The first is, what is something that you wish everybody in the world knew about the field of genetics? And the second question is, what is something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? It can be as silly and insignificant or like big picture important as you'd like. Ooh, this is interesting. So I, hmm, genetics, I have plenty. I'm going to, can I do two? Yeah, sure. Okay. So the one, the first, I guess they're kind of connected. So the first is that all modern day humans originated from one woman um, and her scientific term is called mitochondrial Eve. On the show, we call her big mama or mama mitochondria, but we're all descendants of her. So I wish everyone knew that. Um, because if everyone knew that this leads into two, we would all understand that we're 99% the same. And so again, what you said earlier, I just wish everyone knew and embrace, not just know it, but embrace it and really like hold on to it. We are more, Maya Angela used to say this all the time. We are more alike my friends than we are, than we are not unalike. And so I live by that motto. I really hope everyone else, um, could know that. Um, the other thing that I wish everyone else in the world knew, and this is kind of a silly thing, is that Jay Electronica really is one of the best rappers of all time. <laughs> and <laughs> I get into a lot of arguments about this because he doesn't have an album, but he's from New Orleans and his work is just dope and amazing. And that's a silly one, but yeah. <laughs> silly and oh, it's so important. So a more serious one. Okay. A more serious one. Race is not real. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, this, this was a really wonderful time spent with you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, well, this will be up on YouTube afterward. Um, other things, if you want to support Skype a Scientist, you can do so at patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist. If you'd like to support In Those Jeans, you can go to patreon.com slash In Those Jeans. In Those Jeans. Great. So support both of our things uh, and we'll keep putting out awesome content. Thank you again for joining us. This was so much fun. Um, and join us tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. And we're going to be talking uh, more about genetics um, as part of uh, Black and Genetics Week. And Erin, Erin's on the West Coast. Uh, she woke up so early this morning. We Thank so you, appreciate Aaron. you being here today. Erin, you're amazing. Um, all right. So we will see you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Bye. Thanks, Aaron. Bye. Bye.